In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. St. Paul urges patience, as does the parable in the Holy Gospel. St. Paul urges it as one of the great Christian virtues which depend on charity and flow from charity. Indeed, patience with the faults of others is very much a part of charity. Our Lord urges it in the gospel as a form of prudence. The parable refers to the Catholic Church, the kingdom of God. In this case, he is saying it is more prudent to tolerate sinners in its midst and in the hope of converting them. Patience is a bearing of evil in order that a greater good come about or in order to avoid a greater evil. What is opposed to patience is anger, which is the repression of evil by some punishment. Anger can be either justified or unjustified as it is in accordance with reason or not. We should not think that patience with the faults of others is always a virtue. It is sometimes necessary to use anger in order to correct the faults of others or for the common good. So, for example, judges must mete out to criminals a punishment, which is a form of anger, for the common good. In such a case, patience would be against prudence. So to be patient where you ought to be severe and show some anger would be against prudence. But anger is the exception and patience is the rule. St. Paul says, for patience is necessary for you that doing the will of God you may receive the promise. St. Peter says, for this is thankworthy if for conscience towards God, that means uh, in perceiving the law of God in your case, a man endures sorrows, suffering wrongfully, in other words, if this is the will of God for you, then do it, and this is pleasing to God and thankworthy. For what glory is it if committing sin and being buffeted for it you endure? That is to say, what glory do you have if you have done something wrong and you get punished for it? There's no glory in that. He continues, but if doing well you suffer patiently, that means it, by doing good things, you suffer unjustly, but patiently. This is thankworthy before God. For unto this you are called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving you an example that you should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, did not revile. When he suffered, he threatened not but delivered himself to him that judged him unjustly. So don't forget our Lord when he delivered himself up to all of these injustices was always God. So a creature, Pontius Pilate, a Roman pagan, judging him was in a way the most absurd thing you could think of. This man that did believed in, in, in many strange gods, judging the second person of the Blessed Trinity. But he did this for our salvation. He did this because he loved us and wanted to bring us to eternal salvation. Now, it is impossible to lead a Christian life without patience. We are constantly buffeted by sinners in this life. Think of all the ways in which you have suffered at the hands of others through envy, jealousy, criticism, fault-finding, calumny, and hatred. Often we are the victims of cheating, of lying, and of theft. Then there are the temptations which we must bear with patience those from the world, from concupiscence, and from the devil. 
we are beset the whole day with temptations. And God permits this in order to try our virtue. But it is a cross to bear, these temptations. You wish that they never came. There are many physical sufferings to bear from disease, from poverty, from the weather, from earthquake, and from famine. There is much mental anguish to bear. Think of those who suffer from mental illness, which is one of the worst afflictions of this life. There is much to bear in family life, the faults of one's spouse, the burdens of raising children, the worries over finances and one's job. Many suffer intensely from separation and divorce. St. Francis de Sales said that every day in the state of matrimony is a mortification. There is much to bear from loneliness in the single life and from losing one's spouse to death. Old age is fraught with suffering, both physical and mental. When I turned 70, somebody said to me, do you know what it means? If you wake up in the morning now and you don't have aches and pains. I said, no, what does it mean? He said, it means you're dead. It's true. true. All of these things come to us directly from the original sin of Adam and from the actual sins which we and others have committed. All of the sufferings of this earth come from sin. God created man in a paradise. It was man that messed it up by sin. Our lot is one of suffering in this life as a direct result of sin. It is not God's fault. So always remember, you cannot think of the human race without the overbearing and overwhelming problem of sin and its effects. All of the problems I mentioned come from sin in one way or the other. Our mortality comes from sin, our diseases, our pains come from sin. All of the insanity of the present world comes from sin. The, the crazy, mixed up, insane and bizarre ideas that are coming out of people's heads that would have made our ancestors just shake their heads in unbelief if we told them that now we're hearing all of these insane things. That's all from sin. As the human race comes further and further away from Christ, it descends into more and more the effects of sin. The, the Holy Gospel is what is the remedy to the effects of sin. But the more that the human race recedes from the Gospel, the more it is going to sink, just like a sinking ship, into ideas and, and attitudes and practices which are evil until finally you arrive at the Antichrist when all of this defection from the gospel produces something which is the precise opposite of Christ and that will be the Antichrist when it organizes itself and systemizes itself to that extent. That is the world of sin and the human race is burdened with this problem. And you cannot understand the human race without sin, original sin and its effects, and actual sin and its effects. And a direct result of all this sin is suffering. The gospel has saved us from a great deal of suffering. If there had been no promulgation of the gospel, the human race would be a race of savages. The gospel uplifts people and civilizes them. The beautiful epistle of today's mass, these beautiful virtues 
of which St. Paul speaks, those are all Christian virtues that would make the world a paradise if everyone were to observe them. A, a beautiful paradise if everyone merely observed the virtues that he talked about in this epistle. But the, the effects of sin makes man suffer from himself and from those around him. You must understand that about the human race. This is not a normal, nice place to live. It is a place that labors under sin and the effects of sin. Now, there are examples of patience. Our Lord was always, nearly always, mild and patient towards those around him. With a few rare exceptions, to the Pharisees, he was very severe and even piercing in his criticism. And sometimes to others, uh, there was the famous case of the Canaanite woman. Canaanites were not Jews, and our Lord was in their territory. And this woman comes up to him and says, my daughter is ill, please cure him. She's yelling at him. He's passing by. She's yelling at him. The apostles tell her to keep quiet. He ignores her the first time. The second time, she cries out and says, my daughter is ill. Could, would you please cure her? And he turns around and says, my mission is not to you. My mission is to the Jews. It would not be correct for me to give the food that is meant for the, the Jews to the dogs. Now, this woman has a dying daughter, and he says that to her as if she's a dog. But then she comes back to him with a holy boldness, and she says, yes, but even the dogs get crumbs from the table. And he said, O oh woman, great is thy faith. You see, by his severity, he drew her out. He drew out faith in her. He perfected her by that very severity. So actually, it was an act of mercy that he did that for her. And the daughter was cured. So there was a, there's rare cases where he does that. But the overwhelming conduct of our Lord is one of mercy and mildness. Curing the man in the passion of the ear that was cut off by Peter. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do the forgiveness of the good thief. The apostles consider the tremendous sufferings they endured by the preaching of the Holy Gospel, and finally by their martyrdoms. St. Paul's life was one of great suffering. It's not recorded in the epistles, but it is recorded elsewhere they, that they actually put him in the arena in Ephesus and made him fight as a gladiator. Normally, you would die from that, or you had a 50% chance of dying from that. St. Bernard of Clairvaux said, All the things that the world loves, such as delights, honors, praise, and riches, are for me a cross. And all the things that the world considers a cross, I approach and kiss with great affection. St. Romuald, who was the head, the founder of the Camaldolese order, said uh, he, he was accused by one of his monks of having committed an abominable sin with him. He was condemned in a public chapter as deserving to be hanged and burned. Because of this calumny, he was forbidden to say Mass. He bore all of this in patience, although he was almost 100 years old. St. Teresa of Avila said this, Since the Son of God obtained our salvation through suffering, he willed to teach us that there is nothing more fitting than suffering to give God glory and to sanctify our souls. St. John Chrysostom said, if God grants to you the gift of raising the dead, he would be giving you much less than when he permits you to suffer. 
St. Aloysius Gonzaga said, there is no surer way to know that one is a saint than to see him lead a holy life and yet suffer desolation, trials, and afflictions. And St. Vincent de Paul said, if we only knew the precious treasure hidden in infirmities, we would receive them with the same joy with which we receive the greatest benefits, and we would bear them without ever complaining or showing signs of weariness. So what is the economy of salvation? An economy, an economy is a situation in which you give something and you get something. So what do we give? What do we get? If you go to the grocery store, you give them money, they let you have what's in your basket. There's an economy there. You give and you get. What we give is our suffering upon earth. The daily sacrifice of suffering. And that suffering has been given a value by the sufferings of Christ. If Christ had not suffered himself, our suffering would be useless in, as a sacrifice. It would not rise to God, for it would be simply a payment for something that we deserve, something that we owe. And we could never completely pay the entire amount because sin is an infinite offense, God being infinite. But the sufferings of Christ give value to our sacrifice. That's why St. Teresa said, if God has shown us suffering, it means that it is the way to, to salvation. So we offer our sufferings every single day by this patience, by bearing these crosses, big and small, in union with the sacrifice of Calvary and the holy sacrifice of the Mass, that is offered every day. So the church is constantly sacrificing. Just as in the temple, there were sacrifices the whole day in the Old Testament. The church is constantly sacrificing. The patience begins with the little things. It must be practiced the entire day by means of bearing of little crosses which come to us many times a day, for example, behind the wheel. What greater occasion is there for impatience than the wheel? But there are many other occasions that arise during the day. Little things, little vexations, things that go wrong, things that don't work right, something falls on the floor. These are the, the little crosses that we bear. When we think of mortification, we think of Lent and giving up things. But mortification is every day. It is all through the day. It is resistance to temptations. It is bearing these little crosses of the day, the crosses of state and life. It, patience must be practiced in the day-to-day, long-term sufferings of our lives. The faults of our spouses, for example. Another great occasion of impatience. Or of our children, or friends and relatives. The sufferings of various diseases, pains and infirmities which we may have, whether physical, emotional, or mental. This is especially true of those in their later years. And we must consider the infinite patience of God with us. How many times, for example, have you confessed the same sin? Is there a number you could put on it? And consider God's patience. Consider then the number of graces which you have received in order to repent of these sins. Because you cannot repent without a grace. 
And how many times you have squandered these graces by committing yet more sin. The patience of God is infinite. Consider the patience of Christ in coming into your soul and your body in the Holy Eucharist. Unless you are a saint, your soul, although in the state of grace, is disordered by much venial sin and excessive attachment to created things. In this way, it is like a messy and smelly house. But our Lord wishes to come and dwell in it in any case. Patience must never be a cloak, however, for indiscipline, but it is nonetheless the norm of our daily conduct. It is a sin to tolerate what ought not to be tolerated. Toleration is considered a type of virtue today, that we have to tolerate everything. Toleration is not always good. Sometimes it is very bad to tolerate things. This is not patience, but negligence. In this way, Christ did not tolerate the pride of the Pharisees. He called them whitened sepulchers, full of dead men's bones, and many other severe criticisms. He excoriated them to their faces on many occasions. Nevertheless, it remains true that our first inclination, when evil is inflicted upon us by others, or by life in general, to be patient, deeply convinced by the Holy Gospel and of the necessity of suffering which we must bear in union with the sufferings of Christ. Our first inclination is to push suffering away through anger, some form of anger, just have a perfect life and push everything away that is that is unpleasant to us. That's our first reaction. That's the reaction of nature. But the reaction of grace is to see the value of those sufferings in union with the sufferings of Christ, offering those sufferings for your own sins and for the sins of others. No saint was ever canonized whose life was characterized by a constant vindication of his own rights by outbursts of anger towards his enemies or towards sinners, by acts of cruelty and severity towards those who trespass against them, or by the exacting of strict justice for anyone who did them harm. Instead, we marvel at their lives, in their lives, the patient bearing of these wrongs. Their lives were characterized by, by what St. Paul says pertains to the elect of God. Mercy, benignity, humility, modesty, patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If any have a complaint against another, even as the Lord hath forgive, forgiven you, so you also. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.